All right, guys, here we are with my man, my friend, my homie, all around badass, Scott Strode. What up? <laughs> What's up, Elliot? How you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. Good. How's life? Um, things are good. Yeah. I've just been working away with the nonprofit and, and uh, yeah, just, just charging along. Man, like, I think I've told you this multiple times, bro, the, like the shirt you're wearing right now, sober. Like, can everybody see it? So, you know, Scott is a, uh, do you still say recovering or do you say recovered? Um, either one is fine with me. Okay. Um, I say okay. I'm in recovery, but, uh, right. but yeah. yeah, they're both good. Um, addict. And what I think the, the best thing that I think you've done of all the things, this is just my personal opinion, obviously, um, that you've done out of all the things is normally this is such a, a shameful thing for addicts. Like it's something that they don't want to talk about. Like they, they want to hide from it. And I, this wasn't me and blah, blah, you know, you've taken it and you've created this culture with Phoenix where you like, you guys like scream it to the world. Like, yeah, I'm an addict. Isn't it amazing that I got through that? That's how I take it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, I, I think that there's something powerful about us just being vulnerable about our whole story. You know, I think that, that, um, you know, this idea that if people knew all of me, would they still love me? And, and I think the best way to find out is put yourself out there. Yeah. And, and by doing that, you actually get to be, be yourself maybe for the first time in your life. Um, so for me, wearing this shirt, you know, I don't think everybody's got to wear a shirt that, that, that says, you know, kind of, um, about talks about some of the toughest times in their life. But I think if those of us that are willing make space for others to choose, you know, I think, I think Joe Rogan, it's something that he says really well. He's like, everyone loves a success story, but what we love even better is to watch someone fall to the bottom and then climb back up to the top. Yeah, no agreed. It's like tiger woods, right? Like he was at the top fell to the bottom, but man, last, last year, Sunday, the final Sunday of the masters, tell me, find me five people that weren't rooting for that guy. Like his ex-wife was rooting for him. Right. Like, yeah, he, you know, like, cause it was amazing. And that, and that's kind of what you've done. So share your story a little bit, man. Like where, where did it start? Where'd you grow up and how did you get into it? How did you, how did you get into the, like, as you said, um, the worst parts of your life? Yeah, I um so I grew up in like rural Pennsylvania farmland and and uh my parents divorced when I was really young and and my dad struggles with mental illness and he kind of raised us about half time when we were kids. You know, so we live very different lives with my mom than we did with my dad and we'd go back and forth um at basically every other weekend to either house and um you know, growing up in that environment. And then later on, um, alcoholism was sort of introduced to our family. It was just a tough thing when I was a kid. I, I think, um, there's some gifts you get with growing up around mental illness where you're really good at forecasting emotions and reading people's emotions, but it's also something you have to hone as a survival technique. And for little kids, they just shouldn't be thinking about that. They should be thinking about other stuff when they're kids, but but for me, it was a, it was, it was a tough time when I was growing up. What did your dad suffer from? You know, I don't know that we ever really found out. Like, okay. I don't think he got stabilized enough to, to ever really assess what his struggles are, but it definitely got worse as he got older. Um, and my mom did her best to be sort of a stable environment for us when we were kids. But, um, you know, she was a single mom and, and, uh, and then later on she remarried and, and alcoholism was present. So as a, as a young kid, the first time I stole some booze from a liquor cabinet, I was like, whoa, man, this makes the pain go away. I want to do more of this. And uh, is there anything harder than this? I'm going to go out and try different drugs. And that's how I got started. Right. I think it's interesting, right? But I mean, I think most of us steal the liquor from our, our parents' liquor cabinet, right? I mean, I did. I mean, yeah. I, I, we, I think we all have stories. Um, I, for, I wasn't hiding anything though. I was just like, Oh, let's steal the liquor from my parents' liquor cabinet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that that's, you know, how it started out. And that's the hard part about, um, like they talk about addiction as substance use or substance use disorder. The hard thing about substance use is that like, 
it's different for everybody. Some people, it might be blowing their life up and other people, it might just be having fun with friends and there's no drama. Um, For me, there was a lot of drama. Right. And where, where did, so, (coughs) sorry, started with alcohol. Yeah. It started with alcohol and then it was like the classic kind of route, you know, like started with alcohol. Then I found somebody who sold weed and I was buying weed and they had other stuff and I tried that and that was cocaine. And then I was doing Coke and then I found a guy who smoked Coke. Then we started smoking Coke and next thing, you know, just dabbling in a little crack cocaine, <laughs> smoking <laughs> cocaine, you know, like, um, yeah, and, you know, dabbling, <laughs> dabbling a little crack, you know, it, it kind of becomes a, not really a recreational thing at some point when you're doing it by yourself in an alley, you know? And that was you. Yeah. That was me at the end. Um, and the thing that really kind of anchored me to some hope was the love of, you know, my brother and sister and my mom, and the friends that that understood I had a problem. Most of the people I was using with at that point were also struggled with addiction themselves. Um, and I always say that like a room full of addicts is like the most lonely place on the planet, um, right. even though you're surrounded by people. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's you kind of start these things happen slowly over time. And you kind of don't realize that your dreams are slipping away from you in life and, until you realize one day you look in the mirror and you're, you know, bloodshot eyes and, um, you know, you've been up for two days straight and you realize your life is just slipping away from you. How long did that take for you? Like, so, so you borrow the, like, talk, talk a little bit just about like the, the time between borrowing the, the liquor from your dad's or your mom's liquor cabinet to the alley so it can crack by yourself. Yeah. Two weeks. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just no. jump in the deep end. <laughs> I was 11 and I was, no, um, I actually, that's about when I started, you know, probably 11, 11 started stealing booze. And then, um, by the time I was 15, I was using Coke and dealing with some pretty serious depression. And a lot of it was rooted in that adverse experience or early childhood trauma stuff. And then, um, and then by the time I was 24, I would, uh, I had quit using drugs for a bunch of years, but I was still drinking, but then my drinking got so bad. I'd, I'd black out drunk and then buy drugs. And, and so about 24, I was living in Boston and, you know, going down to alleys and what used to be the combat zone to buy, buy crack and buy cocaine. Right. And you weren't, um, it's not like you had to grow up like that necessarily. Right. Like you weren't like, you weren't like from the hood, like you were. Yeah. Like you were, yeah. Like you're, you have a brother or sister Were did, were they, were they addicts or are they not addicts? They, they each had their own journeys and struggles. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, my mom, you know, had a lot of opportunities for us when we were kids, right. you know, we came from some money on that side, but yet when we were with my dad, we were basically, um, you know, his mental illness would show up and he decided to do a house renovation and he'd tear out the wall and then he'd, he wouldn't be able to put it back in. Right. right. So we'd live in a house with plastic on two walls and we weren't really sure where dinner was going to come from. But yet with my mom, um, it was a very different li- lifestyle. Right. So that, I mean, I always say this about like just teaching kids martial arts um, or teaching kids anything, but you have to make the kid feel safe first. Like before, before everything else that there is before, before you're going to teach them, before they're going to listen to you, before they're going to do anything, a child has to know that they're safe with you. Yeah. If they can't understand that, then you could be the best. You could have all the knowledge in the world and you will not be able to get through to the child. So it sounds like with your dad, there was no safety. Like, no. Yeah. You, you weren't sure of anything. Yeah. Not at all. And I would go so far to say that, that's how we work as adults too. You know, it's like, you want to feel, um, you want to feel that there's a sense of trust there with people before you're going to be vulnerable. And, um, and, you know, as a kid, a lot of times when I was vulnerable, I was wounded emotionally by what came back at me. And, and, uh, so it, you know, of course, drinking made sense. And you had bad experiences with vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. And it took me a lot of years that I started to trust that I actually was deserving and worthy of love just as a person. 
Man. Yeah. That like, so almost your whole childhood, probably you, you didn't feel that you were unsure of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, and, and I don't want to make it sound like then I quit drinking and life was like awesome. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden you get it all figured out, but, um, you know, it was actually a boxing gym. You know, there were some guys got me into a boxing gym in Boston and there were a couple sober guys in that gym. And that became my sort of, um, new tribe that supported me. Right. Um, and they believed in me, even though I didn't yet believe in myself. And that was really the beginning of what would later become the nonprofit that, that, myself and some friends started. What, what was this like for your family at the time? Right. Because I know, man, I guess here I, I'll be super vulnerable. Um, like my sister's a mess and we, we just found out some craziness with my sister, uh, you know, or I did like a week ago, two weeks ago. And it's just like, Jesus Christ. And for me, like, uh, uh, like my, like, I just worry about my parents. Right. So I'm kind of like, as, as an older adult now, like we're, we're not 20 anymore. Like she did this 20 years ago from for her late mid to late teens till she was like 23. Then it seemed like she got her shit together. Right. And now, you know, 35, 36 years old here, here, here we are again. And I want to be like, you know what? I, fuck you. Right. Like fuck off. Like, do you, do you not see our dad? Do you not see our mom? Look, look what you do to them. Yeah. Like, so how did your family handle this? Cause I know I'm not handling it super great. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. And, um, and family dynamics are really tough for anybody. You know, I don't think anybody's really grown up in that, like perfect, you know, family that we're all aspiring to have. Right. Like, you mean, you, you don't know the two and a half kids, white picket fence, have sex with your wife two and a half times a week, perfectly on the dot. And it's amazing. With no problems. Dinner's cooked at six. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever that person is, is probably on their way to a divorce because it's, they're, they're, they're making something up. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they got it. They're not being real, but um, like, I think the family dynamic is tough because in a family of origin, right. We, we kind of become, we play a part in the play, right? Right. Like that we're cast into that part sort of. And it's, it's hard over time because, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to change that role. And for me, my family was really accepting, but the friends that I was around weren't right. They were like, um, you know, I, I, I wounded a lot of people in my addiction. You know, I had, had a lot of amends to make to my mom and my siblings but they deeply loved me and they, you know, forgave me and it took time to build that trust again, but they kind of let me back in. The hard part is when you're holding up that mirror to your friends that you're with and you're using really hard and you're like, Hey man, I think I might have a problem. They're like, no, no, man, you're good. You know, cause for, for you to have a problem, they would have to look at their own stuff too. Um, so it's really strange how your kind of peer group can kind of pull you back into addiction. Yeah, man, I'm going to go down the family route a little more just, I think maybe because it hits the home with me right now. Um, how am I ever going to trust my sister again? So how, how did you, I mean, how, how did your family trust you again? Like, what did that look like? Cause I know, I mean, like she's going to tell me, cause for 10 years, it looked like she's the last 10 years of my sister looked like, all right, you know, me, yeah, I don't know. Right. But she's kind of got her shit together, but kind of doesn't have her shit together. And then, you know, we, then boom, this big, crazy story. So I'm sure your family went through a lot of that with you, right? Yeah. Like, what does that look like? Just a day-to-day -day process? You know, I think, I think it's like with, withdrawing those healthy boundaries and kind of figuring out how far you can go to love somebody is, is tough. And it's really hard for families when people are in active addiction or struggling um, with whatever it is they're struggling with. That's sort of self-destructive or destructive to people around them. Cause it's not always drinking and drugs. Right. Sometimes it can be, you know, workaholism. And sometimes it can be, you know, if I make this much money someday, I'll be happy. Or, or if I look like this someday, I'll be happy or this many followers or whatever it is. But I think it's, um, setting a boundary that protects the things that are important to you and then loving that person in that space up to that line. Right. Like, like ultimately with my father, I had to get to a place where I can actually love him more by not having him in my life. And, 
And some people are like, well, he won't be here forever. You should try to make amends. I was like, dude, you don't really know him. <laughs> like, it doesn't work like that. Like, um, so I think with your sister, you just got to figure out, like, I can show up in a relationship with her to this point. But after that, this is where I need healthy boundaries. And if she doesn't show up for me in the way that I need, then she's making a choice. It's not, it's not you. Does that make sense? Uh, that was really good. Like, you know, yeah, here's my, here's my, here's where I am. Right. Yeah. I read this book called chasing the scream. Have you read it? I actually haven't read it, but a lot of people talk to me about it. I guess I got to pick that one up, man. It changed. It made me call my friend who, who he and I'd had a falling out, you know, uh, with, with addiction. Yeah. And it, it was so much easier with him. It was so, it was much easier with him because he's, you know, because it's, it, it wasn't so close. Like, I could, I could, you could be removed a little bit. I think that's the hard part with families, right? Is it's so hard to remove yourself. Yeah. And, and you're like, you know, cause I'm like watching my parents and it's and like, ugh, they're my parents too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not, it's not just like it's her parents. Yep. And there's an allegiance there to, that you feel to protect them too. Yeah. You know, so there's, it, it it's can makes makes it feel conflicted, you know. Right, they're seventy years old, right? Yeah, you know, they don't. Who needs this at the end of their life? Yeah, I know, I know, man. Well, if there's ever anything I can do to help out, um, yeah, uh, you know, we we'll, we'll get through it. I'm. I think it's yeah. just, it's good to talk about, right? Because I'm sure there's other people that are dealing with exactly my issue and and we'll, we'll you know and your issue and like so I guess like what what was it like for your siblings? You know? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think for them, they were, they had their own stuff they went through, you know? Okay. So we, it was, it was probably hardest for my sister. Cause she was, you know, in some ways the attention she got when we were younger was, was drawn away from her because my brother and I were, you know, we were train wrecks at times, you yeah. know? So it was easy for the family to focus in on us cause we were, we were making the most noise. Um, but you know, that's where some of my amends were or is around just sort of, um, how it affected her when she was, when she was growing up around that. And how much older are you than her? Or is she older? She, she's older than me. Okay. My brother's the oldest and okay. she's in the middle. Um, so what's the age differences? Um, I'm five years from my brother and my sister's right in between. So Okay. So, so two and a half, so yeah. two and a half, like two and a half each way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But we're, we're all pretty close now. And, and, you know, the one thing is like the, it was tough when we were kids, but that stuff actually bonded us really close because we went through it together. You know, we were kind of each other's support network. And I think that's sort of something you experience, you know, I mean, you know, this from, mm -hmm. from jujitsu and any kind of martial art, like when you're kind of facing that greater adversity, even if it's just the Randori session, you know, like it builds a bond between people and that, in that bond, you find some support. Struggle we, brings people together. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I found that with my siblings and that's also a big part of the nonprofit of the Phoenix. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the Phoenix because man, it's amazing. You, uh, you took this awful thing that you went through and now you've, uh, I, I mean, I'm looking at it from the outside. So please, I hope don't, so don't get mad at me when I say this, <laughs> like, fuck, it's almost, it was almost worth it. <laughs> I mean, you know, like you, it, it's more than worth it from, from where I'm, I don't know from where you're sitting, right. Cause you're the one who had to deal with it. But me as the person who just gets to look at the amazingness of what it is that you do and what it is that you do for people. Like, I mean, I get, I, I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, I actually have listened to your podcast before and I think it's you're you're in a similar place in this. You've gotten to have some extreme experiences in your life, oh, you yeah. know, and not all the same, not quite the same as smoking crack maybe, but, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the, you know, being in the UFC and, and, and helping be a mentor to so many people in martial arts and um, you know, you, you have gotten perspective on things that a lot of people don't get to see inside of right. and that you get to share that, you know, I, I always like the quote that wisdom is what you get a second after you needed it. 
Um, One more time. Wisdom is what you get a second after second you needed after it. You needed. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, that was hold it. On, from- hold on, hold on, wait, wait. <laughs> I got to write that down. That was too good. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. One more time. I'm going into my notes right now. Wisdom is what you get a second after you needed it. Wisdom is what you get a second after you needed it. Boom. That's amazing. Yeah. I like that one. I don't know who said it, but somebody doesn't matter. (laughs) That that person. Good job. Good job. That person. But, um, but I think that addiction, you know, I always kind of believe that like walking in the dark allows you to appreciate the light so much more. And, um, and I felt, I really do feel like getting into recovery was like getting out of a burning building for me. And how can you walk away if you know other people are in there? You know, you got to go back and help try to get people out. And that's just a big, you know, kind of anchor in the recovery community is being of service to others because you know how hard it is. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> they're there. So how, like if you know, if you know someone's dying, like it's one thing if you don't know. Yeah. But once, once, you know, you can't just leave them there to die. No, and that's, I, I, I see it. You know? So I just, I honestly just wanted to kind of get people an opportunity to do the, some of the stuff I did. You know, I, I got, I got in the boxing gym that changed my life. I got out climbing that changed my life. Um, I started doing triathlons and um, I realized my whole support network at that point was more focused on getting up at five in the morning to climb a mountain than staying out till five in the morning. Like I used to do. And um, so with a couple of my climbing partners and friends, we just said, you know, how do we start a nonprofit that turns people onto this stuff? And, and um, we, we started getting punch passes to a climbing gym and making it free to take people there. We started leading a bike ride and a hike. And essentially the Phoenix is a free, sober, active community. So we use the inherent transformative power of sports and activity to help people who are in recovery. So you have to be 48 hours clean and sober. And you have to adhere to a code of conduct and that code of conduct is designed to create a supportive environment. So basically don't be a jerk and don't be creepy and you can come to Phoenix if you're 48 hours sober. Right. You just said something a second ago that I guess I want to touch on and we'll to before and we'll get back to the Phoenix. Um, you decided at one point in your life to wake up at five in the morning and go climbing rather than stay out until five in the morning. When was that, when was that decision and what made that decision? Well, you know, for me, I had to kind of get the, the chemicals out of my system first before it was actually a choice, you know, like I had to get clear my head enough. I always say this, like a lot of times you'll hear people say somebody has to hit rock bottom before they'll change around addiction. And I don't agree with that. I think that people need clear headed moments of perspective on their life. And those are our big change moments and they come sometimes because somebody injects them into our life with something they say to us. And they also come sometimes because we're fortunate enough to get a couple of days clean and sober and, and we can look at what our life has become. And that's what happened to me. Um, I remember my first day, you know, I decided I needed to make a change and I went out in the morning and I'm like, Whoa, there's a lot of people out in the morning on a weekend. You know, I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know anything happened till like around noon on a Saturday. <laughs> and, and, um, were you in Boston? Yeah, I was in Boston. And especially <laughs> in that town, like, you know, I thought everybody drank at the bars in Boston, right? And pretty much everybody does. But, um, uh, you know, I, I started finding this group of guys at the boxing gym and they would, they would go there and we'd wait outside with our gym bags till they open the gym and and i just go there every day that was my place and and it was in that moment i realized like i would rather be with these guys than the people that were walking home from the bars or from the after party at the same time and that just happened yeah it it did it it it's um you know i don't know there's something special about the coach like just having that belief in me that you know I still thought I still thought that I was worthless at the time, even though, 
you know, I think a lot of people around me probably didn't perceive me that way, but in my mind, that's how I thought of myself, you know, like even friends from that time, they're like, dude, I didn't know you had a problem, but a lot of it was happening internally. You know, a lot of that like self-loathing and shame and all that stuff was inside and people didn't see it often from the outside. Um, but I just remember when the boxing coach, um, you know, asked me to help out and to hold the mitts for somebody for the first time, you know, I felt like, whoa, like they're like, they need me. Right. And somebody's looking up to me now. I need to show up in a different way. And that started to heal some of those self-esteem wounds. Do they ever come back? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, there's this woman called Pia Melody. She, she runs a, started a treatment center called the Meadows. And it's a, I think it's a good treatment center for folks with substance use disorder, but she talks about self-esteem as something you have or don't have that there aren't, aren't really degrees of it, you know? And it's an interesting way to think of it. Like that, um, there's times you're like, yeah, I got this. And then you're like, no, nah, man, I'm going to screw up, you know, no, no way can I do this. And then you're like, no, 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 wait. Okay. I got this. I got this. You know, like you go back and forth, but rarely is you're like, I'm 50% there. Like, I think I could do this. Maybe, you know, it's like either you doubt or you believe. And that's, that I think is around the self-esteem stuff. And I think when you believe and you evidence that in other in aspects of your life, it starts to flow over into other things. Like sometimes pushing through that fear, you know, say in jujitsu on the mat, you'll go home and you'll be like, you know what, maybe I can push through this fear and have this kind of harder conversation with my boss that I've been putting off because I'm just intimidated to do it. Um, so you find courage, um, sometimes in strange places, but once you do, it becomes part of you in a unique way, I think. Yeah. Sometimes, mm, like for me, I'll, I'll give an, like an example of what I, I guess what I mean by like yourself is like the, it doesn't come back. Um, and, and I totally understand what you're saying there with like, you know, like you, you build it, you, you get a glimpse of it and then it builds and builds and builds. Right. Yep. But like, you know, uh, yesterday I was out in my garage working out. I love working out in the garage. It's my favorite place to work out. <laughs> um, and the, the neighbor, a couple, a couple neighbors down, they were having a party and like our kids are friends and, and we weren't invited, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and we weren't invited. And I struggle with this because this was my life growing up. Like I was never invited. Yeah. Right? Like I, I was never, I was never the cool kid and I was never allowed to come to the party. Like, so I'm like looking out, I'm working out. I'm like, no, Elliot, it's okay. Right. It, it's okay. Like that, this, this says nothing about you, you know, yeah. like this doesn't mean that I won't have friends anymore or this doesn't mean that yada yada or all these things. And for, um, for me, I'm coming, I take Lexapro and I'm coming down. Right. I'm trying to see if I can get off of it. Yeah. So it's a motherfucker getting off of it. it is. Oh, oh my, it's, it's, sucks. I've had lots of friends go through it and it's, it's, it's a journey. It's sure. a journey. I don't think I thought it was going to be fast. It ain't going to be fast, man. So, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, that's what I mean. Like, do you still struggle with, like, do you still dip back in? Like, does your mind ever go back to that? Like I'm worthless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, I think that stuff, sometimes when we have those emotional wounds, it's like this sensitive place and every now and then something in life lands in that place. And it, it's like, uh, it's like having a bruise and then bumping that bruise again, right? It always hurts more yeah. than, and it's the same, same kind of thing. And I think, you know, I try to be mindful. I don't think I can take away that, uh, like personalization or emotional response because those wounds were inflicted with such emotional um, power. But I, I can be aware when something's landed there because I, I always notice that my reactions like a little bit outsized for the situation. Like I'm more upset than everybody else. I should not be this fucking yeah. mad right now. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> totally. Because, because you know, you, on another day you could drive by and be like, "Oh, thank God we didn't have to go to that party. I just want right. to go home and shit." Yeah, you know, no, of course, of course. <laughs> right. I didn't want to go to the party, man. <laughs> right. Oh, I, I, I didn't want to go at all. <laughs> I wanted to work out and then go sit on my couch and watch football. 
Right. Yeah. But, but when stuff lands there, it brings up that, that old stuff. Um, you know, and I think that's, um, the, the, for me around those adverse experiences as a kid, like when my dad would say stuff about me and kind of chip away at my self-esteem when I was really little, um, it was powerful, right? That was my dad. That was actually the only person I was aware of in the world, you know, besides my mom, right? That's like God, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's two of them as a kid, your mom and your dad. Right. And you don't understand there's other things in the world and there's other things influencing his life. All you know is, is that, you know, I believe this blame belongs with me. And, and, and you know, so even though cognitively, you know, I know that, I have value and am deserving of love now, you know, for years later, when I would deal with a guy who was like kind of the age of my dad, it was tough. You know, I was always, anything they'd say, I was, I would like take it to heart and feel like I did something wrong or feel like something was wrong with me. And it took me years to kind of unweave that from the fabric of who I was. And honestly, that's where like for me crossing finish lines and, and, you know, in triathlons or standing on top of mountains or, you know, getting in the ring for the first time or whatever it was started to evidence to me that that narrative he shared with me when I was a kid wasn't true. Yeah. I mean, do you, um, are you religious? Cause I know a lot of people like they go the very, like when you go, when you do the sober thing, it's like, you know, you, you put your trust in God, like, is that part of it for you or is that, and I know this is a touchy subject. I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. You know, um, no, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I, you know, my mom took us to church when we were kids and she's like, do you want to keep going? And we were like, no, <laughs> you know, and she was like, all right. So that was about our only exposure to it. But, uh, um, I don't know, know that I've ever met a kid that said yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so I'm not, but I am, you know, I, I think that, um, I was, I, I got to, when I got sober and started climbing, I had a chance to go climb in Nepal. So we went to the Himalayas, a couple of buddies and I, and we were over there and got exposed to Buddhism and, and that particular type of Buddhism kind of believes that, that no one can reach enlightenment right. until everyone does. So there's this sense of like service to others to help people on that journey and that stuck with me. So even though faith wasn't part of my life, like, I don't know, that's something I think about that we're all really connected um, and that, that we are here to be of service in some way to others. Yeah. I've, I've landed there as well, you know, um, through, through struggle, right. Through, through struggle, through difficult times, like what's the point of all of this? You know, it can't be to argue about these, these topics. It's gotta be, to do, to get through them together, you yeah. know? And, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm super into Buddhism right now. You know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm reading a lot of Buddhism. I have a friend who's super into it. So, um, do you meditate? Do you do things like that? Um, I'm, I'm trying, like I got one of the meditation apps for your phone that like reminds you to meditate. And honestly, it helps me a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you Go ahead. Uh, do i oh yeah i just uh so the podcast that came out today is with this guy who was a, i don't even know him um i got introduced to somebody else i did a podcast with and he he's this huge met yogi and this meditator american guy too um and he changed my life with meditation he does this thing called heart rate variability med meditation so there's no pause it's like and it's all the it's all through your nose mm -hmm. it's like in breath for five and out breath for six and then immediately like you know like so there's yeah. no pause you know and dude you get to this thing it's fucking crazy man it's called the freeze where like uh. you are you're just frozen it's so nuts like i <laughs> i mean it sounds hokey i know it sounds totally hokey but like like the first day i didn't do it well like i i did it but like you're too worried if you're doing it right Right. You know, like yeah. the first day, like, oh shit. Oh shit. I took a pause. Fuck. I fucked the whole thing up. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like the second day, I didn't worry as much. Like I was just calmer about the whole situation. And dude, I was like, whoa, what was that? Yeah. And, and man, I, I, and I used to, I, I mean, I've meditated, I'd say for the last three years, I probably meditated 90% of the days. So, yeah. and this, like, this rocked my world. This rocked uh, my world last week. It was amazing.
That's an, that's awesome. And there's a lot of evidence actually around, um, there's a, uh, around adverse childhood experience stuff. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. that this is what you're working through, but for me, like the meditation actually can help kind of bring you back and, and be present and, and, um, clear that sort of stress that, you know, we get, to, you know, it's always amazing what, how you wake up in the morning, often kind of not as worried as how you went to sleep. And it's like, you get to reset overnight. And I think meditation is just like a little dose of that during the day. I feel like I, as I get better at it too, like I don't need even like throughout my day, I can just take a couple breaths to, to have the reset happen, which is really nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to have to, ch- you have to tell me more about it. I'll send you a link. On, <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing, man. Like, I don't, I don't know between, uh, you know, I don't know if you know him, big, tall Alex, he's like as tall as you, he's bald too. He's got a bigger beard um, <laughs> between him getting me to sit up and meditate. And, uh, and this, this it's, yeah, it's kind of changed my world. I really love it. Um, so, uh, I'll send you the link. Nice. <laughs> it's called a sure. heart rate variability. Yeah. Um, but so let's get back to the Phoenix now. So you guys figure, you know, you and some buddies, right. You and some buddies are like, all right, you know, let's, 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 let's go back into other people's darknesses and, and help them, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I think the, you know, um, I say this a lot, but like one thing I really do believe is like from a, from the top of a mountain, you see something in yourself that you can't see from down here. And, um, so we just thought, how do we take some more people up a mountain with us? And literally, you know, we started uh, taking people out climbing and, and uh, getting people training for triathlons and raced mountain bikes and all this stuff. And um, we started a little over 12 years ago and we were, we had 60 people come. We were in Boulder, Colorado at the time. And we've now just opened in our um, 23rd state now with programs and we've served over 33,000 people with free recovery support since we started 12 years ago. Dude, a real life coach. That's what I call a life coach. I hate these people that call themselves life coaches, you know, because man, what do you mean you're a life coach? Look, this is how I did it. I don't know. Any, I don't know anything else. Right. Yeah. I don't know a whole lot. What I know is taking people to the top of a mountain. What you just said, you can see yourself in a different light. So yeah. look, come on, come to the top of the mountain with me. Let's just climb the mountain. To me, that's a life coach, yeah. right? Like I don't, man, I don't know how I, I just know how I do it. I can't tell you how to do it. Like if you want to come along, let's go. Yeah. Right. Like, and, and the beauty is what they're going to find there is different for everybody. You know, yeah. like what people, what people find on the jujitsu mat is different for everybody, but like it's transform transformational for everybody. What does know? a strawberry taste like? Yeah. Right. I don't know. We both are eating a strawberry, but it might taste totally different to you than it does to me, but we both could like it. Yeah. Yeah, right? exactly. We don't know. We don't I, know. I always thought there'd be a big business for life coach and life coaches on how to be successful life coaches. There is. There's training now, bro. <laughs> like dude, it drives me, Scott, it drives me fucking insane. Man. Like when I see on people's like Instagram handle life coach, I'm like, Oh my God. I got, like, I'm like, what, what does that mean? Who taught you this? You know, like, does yours never go bad? Like, the, the, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the beauty of like, I mean, the people that I looked to for mentorship are the folks that like keep it real. Right. That talk about the tough stuff equally. Cause if somebody feels like they kind of like got it all figured out, then they're, I don't know if they're shooting you straight, <laughs> you know, it's the folks no. that, uh, that are, that talk about what the tough stuff is and how they get through it. And, and that's where the w- real work's done anyway. That's why I say, I love my wife. I've had a lot of fun times with a lot of people, not just talking about sex, right? Like you've had a lot of fun times with a lot of people. My wife and I've been through some fucking terrible things together. That's why we're, that's why, right? Like that's what, that's the bond. The bond wasn't the football game that we went to last week. Sure. That was fun, but I could have done that with the neighbor and had fun. Right. You know, it's once again, it's pushing through that greater adversity together and still being there for each other. It right. becomes that bond. So what was, uh, what was the CNN thing like for you? Right. Cause I mean, you got to be a, not just like, not what it is now where like, you know, a million people get nominated and they call themselves like CNN heroes, right. You are the top 10, like the end of the year, <laughs> like Scott, I think I still have it on my DVR. Scott Strode, CNN hero. 
<laughs> um, it was cool because it was like the first time, you know, rarely do you hear about addiction and, and have it be about the positive side, the hope mm-hmm. side of recovery. It's almost always the camera in the person's face in their darkest moment, right? Like the, the drunk actor, you know, slurring at the camera, somebody with their, you know, kind of, um, you know, getting arrested with their mug shot, you know, that kind of thing. That's what we like to catch. Yeah. We like yeah. to catch the, we like to catch the bottom of people. Yeah. And I think that's like, I always talk about that. That's like throwing flash paper on a fire. It burns quick, but it doesn't warm your soul, right? It keeps you warm for a second, but then you got to look for the next sort of tragedy to observe in whatever kind of media content you're devouring, you know? Um, But the stuff that really fills your soul is that like deep connection, that stuff you're talking about with your wife or the stuff you find with your really close friends when you're training or the people you get to the top of a mountain with. But um, for the first time, media was like, we want to tell this story, this hope side and that recovery is possible. And that was really inspiring that, that they wanted to do it on the Phoenix and my work. Why did you name it the Phoenix? Um, it's just the story of the Phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, you know, I think we're all rising from the ashes of something in our life. Mine just has happens to be drinking and drugging and and early childhood trauma stuff. But but everybody's got a story of adversity they've had to overcome. And some people are in the middle of that battle right now, and some people are on the other side of it. And um, so I think the Phoenix is just something that speaks to a lot of us. Yeah. I don't believe in the other side. Yeah. You know, I believe I'm always in the middle, like my, my, my devil's anxiety, you know, like that's my demon. And yeah, I just wake up and I, I am, you know, it's like your shirt, you're sober, but yeah. you know, but you, you're very aware of what the other side looks like. Yeah. Right. You're, you're very aware of the, of the flip side of today. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I, I, yeah, I, got, I kind of almost like embrace that, you know, yeah. like, of like, all right, and it's, it's just one day at a time. Right. And that's, that's the, I, I treat my anxiety. Like I think a lot of people treat addiction one day at a time. I got to go earn it today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to go at it. You know, I think that's, it makes it manageable too. It makes it like bite sized, you know, <laughs> like if you, and, and, and it doesn't put that pressure on you. You know, one, one thing about being re- in recovery, if you get some time in recovery, all of a sudden people start feeling like I need to have it all figured out. Right. I got, I got, I'm coming up on 23 years in April of 23 years, clean and sober. And, and it doesn't mean that I'm any smarter or further along than anybody else. It just means I've linked together, uh, you know, more of those, you know, one day at a time, one day at a time, 23 consecutive years in a row. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can stay in that humility, you know, it's like, it's better to be humble than humbled. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I think you, I think you taught me that lesson on the (laughs) jujitsu. Oh yeah. I think somebody taught me that lesson too. (laughs) Right. Like, yeah, it's better to be humble than, you know, very few people has it, has the other way worked out. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. <laughs> Very few. I mean, every once in a while it works out. The problem is, is when it works out like the Conor McGregor's of the world, right? When it, when it works out for the unhumble, everyone tries to now do that because they want that. They chase that money, right? They chase that dollar, or that fame or that high, right? Yeah. Like what, whatever it is. And that, ch- that, that chase can be so, so goddamn dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And even the folks that make it there, there's, you better believe they're waking up and there's still stuff they got to grapple with, you know, like it's, it's better to think of it as a journey than a destination and just try to make the journey as good as you can. Yeah. We're going to, we're all going to end up in the same place, right? Yeah. A box and somewhere, (laughs) somewhere in the ground, you know, somewhere back with the earth. Like there's, there's no escape in that. Nobody gets out alive. Yeah. (laughs) Suskin said to me the other day, we were talking about something, you know, you know, Sus, right? Yeah. And he was talking about something and he was like, ah, oh, you know, your twenties is this, your thirties is this, your 40, blah, blah, blah. You know? And I was like, man, I'm a decade early. I'm going to die young. You know, I'm a decade early on everything. I'm going to die young. And he goes, Oh, you still think you're going to live forever. He's like, you're acting like you're going to escape death. And I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> I was like, you motherfucker. You know, cause it was so, he was like, his point was so right there, you know? 
And yeah, every, everyone, it's kind of the only one thing is coming for us. Yeah. So what do we do between now and then, you know, that's the matters, right? That's what matters, man. Yeah, for sure. So, um, how does, if somebody is looking some like, you know, they're down and out, man, like they hear, they hear this podcast, right? They hear this podcast. Um, they're not 48 hours sober yet. They can't, let's say they can't come to a Phoenix, right? They're, it's because it's, you know, it's not there. What, what, what's the step, man? What, what's the, but they hear it and they go, okay. I just got to make it 48 hours now. How do they get to that 48 hours? Like, what do you, what, what's your advice? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, I think the, you know, honestly to start like Googling around and trying to find resources close to you, if you need like detox or, or somebody to talk to, um, I think, you know, that's one beauty of the 12 step community. It's, it's free. It doesn't fit for everybody. Cause there's this also, there's, a bit of a faith element to it, but, um, but you can walk into any a, a room or NA room or 12 step room and just kind of raise your hand and ask for help. And, um, almost always somebody's going to scoop you up and try to help you on the journey. Um, you know, folks can reach out to the Phoenix at the phoenix.org and we'll do our best to try to plug people in. But also one thing you can do is, is just to try to sort of change, where you are, right? Like if it's reaching out to, to other people in your life that you felt like were, were there for you in tough times and ask for some help or try something new, you know, get a, get a couple of days clean and sober and go do a drop in at a jujitsu studio or martial arts Academy, or go try cycling or climbing, or just get your body moving, kind of like get out of your own head and try to connect with other people. Cause I really think that, that at the root of addiction in, in many ways is this sense of isolation. So trying to connect with others and it's really hard to do when you're in that place. Cause it gets pretty dark and there's a lot of shame. Um, and that's, that's one reason I also wear, wear this shirt. I think that we gotta be, we gotta make more space to be able to love people even through their mistakes. Um, and if, if people feel like there's somewhere to go, um, you know, they'll be more likely to get there if, if they don't think they're going to be judged, um, by asking for help. Yeah. That's the most important part, right? That like, you can't, that's so hard. That's so hard because everyone, everywhere are all so afraid of that. Right. Especially in your worst moments, like you were saying, like in, in the worst, in the, in the pits of hell that like, you just know people are going to judge you. Most people, and most people are, it's probably the problem is it's true. Yeah. I mean, we had, I've had friends I've helped get into treatment six times and somebody's like, when are you going to give up on this dude? And I was like, when, when he stops asking for help, right? <laughs> like if he raises his hand and he's ready and he wants to go, I'll try, you know, and I'm always you never getting, stop, huh? No, man, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you never know what, uh, what's, what you're going to do in somebody's life. That's going to make that difference. And I don't even know, you know, I'll share this because this was meaningful to me, but years ago, Phoenix was growing as a nonprofit and we were, you know, trying to raise money. And like, as you grow as a nonprofit, it's like, you're never quite, you know, it's not like you ever flush with cash, right? <laughs> like the engine gets bigger. You just need to pour more fuel into it. But this issue is so serious. I'm hearing from people all across the country that have loved ones that need help with addiction. And we're trying to get Phoenix into those communities. And, um, and I was given some of my own money to Phoenix at the time and money was like pretty tight for me. And I was training jujitsu with you and, um, oh. and I couldn't, I couldn't afford to, uh, pay for it at the time. And I was like, Hey man, um, sorry, I'm going to have to stop training. Cause I just can't swing it right now. And you invited me back. You're like, so, so I'll see you next Tuesday at 10 AM, you know? And, um, you trained with me for almost a year like that. And it made a big difference in my life. Um, and so it's like people go that extra step once in a while uh, for somebody. And, and you didn't know it at the time, but for me at that time, jujitsu was my outlet. It was my meditation. It was my place. I went to re re um, revitalize myself so I could go back and 
take on this task of, of the work at the Phoenix. And uh, just for something that was relatively simple for you to do for me made a huge difference. And so you never know when you can play that role in somebody's life. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, man. I didn't know. I just knew that like, I knew you were doing a lot of good for a lot of people and uh, money didn't, money couldn't get in the way. Right. No, there's, there's no way money could get in the way of that. So for like, there's been, I could see that jujitsu was important for you. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't know like the extent of it, but like, you know, you, you were the catalyst for me. I, I've never charged anybody for a private since then. No way, man. That's nope. awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I could afford it, it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't do it, you know? Yeah. I don't do it. You know, you, you were the catalyst for this, for this, for me, Scott, like that made me realize that I have this gift that I have of jujitsu and that I like to teach it and I like to do it. And I don't, um, like I'm going to Hawaii on Tuesday and I'm teaching two seminars and, uh, we're charging, but that money's, I don't take a penny, yeah. you know? And so, you know, we're, we're donating to save the reef foundation because it's a huge thing in Hawaii. You know, like, like the reefs are the, oh, reef, yeah. you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, when I started competing again, like I, I thought like, it's crazy how it happens. Right. I thought of you and I was like, man, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't get paid for jujitsu anymore. You know, that's, that's not what people, that's so all of my money I donate. And that, that literally was from that conversation in the office in Boulder. Dude. You know, well, so, thank, thank you, man. Thank you too, man. Like, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's been, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know? So I appreciate it, but, uh, that's it, man. So, um, if ever, tell anybody, just give some information about the Phoenix. If people are struggling, like how, how do they find that? How do, I mean, wh what do they do? Like, okay, I am 48 hours sober now. Yeah. How do I, how do I find the Phoenix? So just go to the phoenix.org and people can learn more and donate there because <laughs> um, we are a nonprofit. Um, but, uh, the and big like thing you said, the money always, you always need more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but you know, you go there and there's, you can kind of look up wherever you are in the country and try to find a Phoenix near you. And if there isn't one near you, but you have some skills you're willing to share as a volunteer, um, you know, like you're a CrossFit coach or a strength training coach or a yoga instructor or whatever, you can reach out to us uh, through the website and kind of raise your hand and say, you know, I'd like to help bring this program to my community. And uh, so it's been, you know, the same way that it, uh, Easton training center has opened their doors to us to do a seminar for Phoenix. You know, people, um, will open up their gym sometime and, and teach a couple classes or something, give us an opportunity to get people in recovery in their community, uh, into these different sports that make so much of a difference in people's lives. Um, so you can either get involved by volunteering your time to be a coach or a trainer. You can also, um, go there to come to a Phoenix event. Um, and like I said, they're all free. You have to be 48 hours sober. Um, and all of our contact info is on there. If people have questions or they need some guidance on how to get into recovery. Sounds good. I'll put it in the show notes so um, people can find it. Uh, I appreciate it, man. You're a man, bro. Oh, you know, dude. You, you, help, you help a lot of people in the world, and that's that's the goal. You know, that's the goal. Yeah, you are too, man. It was like uh, uh, just it was a jujitsu was a big part of those years of my life, like getting me to where I am. So thanks for walking that path with me. Yeah, we just got lucky that we found it, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's right, for sure. <laughs> So cool, man. I appreciate it. Um, it will come out next Monday. I'll send you all the notes so that you can share with the Phoenix people and, and all of that. Thanks for your time. I know you are a busy man. <laughs> good deal, man. You are too. Have a good one. It's good Thanks, seeing man. you. I appreciate you too, bro. Bye. Bye.